I was walking out of the bathroom a few minutes ago, and as I opened the door, Cecil, like I'm walking out, and Cecil's still in the bathroom. He says, oh, that's nice and warm. And I was like, what are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) The most challenging part of building any estimate is finding the right parts in stock and at the right price. Now you could open a bunch of tabs, search each vendor's website, enter your customer's vehicle information, and compare pricing and availability. But if you're following the 300% rule, this can take up a lot of your time. That's why Lucas and I both use Parts Tech at our shops. It's one website to see an unlimited number of parts and tire vendors. With one click, we can import parts and order them from multiple vendors all at once. And here's the best part. Parts Tech is absolutely free to use. And your shop management system is probably already able to connect with it. To get started, just click the link in the show notes or go to partstech.com forward slash podcast. That's partstech.com forward slash podcast. Mr. Walker, introduce yourself, buddy. Uh, Nathan Walker, Walker Automotive in Wilmot, New Hampshire. Wilmot, New Hampshire. Where? How far? Like, where in New Hampshire is that? Um, a little south of Central. So what I've got forward, uh, what I'm looking forward to when I leave here Friday night is going home to about a 100-degree temperature swing. Oh, my yeah. God. Well, yeah. It's yeah. going to be in the minus 20s Friday night. I uh, I think I would stay here if I was completely <laughs> honest with you. you what, think- <laughs> what airport does like Southwest and stuff fly into? That's uh, Boston has the most options. Manchester is like half the distance, but a lot of times there's uh, you know layovers and stuff. Whereas okay. Boston, Boston was direct to here, so that was easy. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I don't know. I don't. I, I'm okay with the layovers. He he always makes fun of me because he's like. Why are you flying to Chicago first? I'm like, I don't know. It's like, well, it's 35 minute wait. And then I, I, I get off the plane, I walk to the it, next plane, I get back on. It, and we Here's go. the thing about layovers is that the layover increases your likelihood of having a delay or something happening That's by 50% you fly at least. Not Southwest. Southwest had a stellar oh, reputation prior. right up until yeah. like the last two to three months. Yeah. They had a stellar reputation on being on time. And it wasn't until, it's been in the last year, like all of a sudden I'm having problems. But my wife used to have, she used to travel two weeks out of every month. She was on the road. And she would not fly anything but Southwest because she's like, I'm going to get on the plane. I'm going to get off on time. And I never have to worry about it. I don't get delayed. Yeah. Yeah. And, And so I've always... I've attached to that. Yep. He doesn't. He's out of Charlotte, and their hub is American, American. right? And, so and, he and flies American, and it's a crapshoot whether you'll get on that. No, I, hey, <laughs> knock on wood. I better knock on wood. I have never. I have. They you have always ne- take direct flights. They've never let me down. And now I've got enough points that when I show up in the airport and I'm in there so much, they're like, Mr. Underwood, don't worry. That flight was canceled. We'll move you to this one. And all those people, they move me right up in the front of that line. And all those people are really upset about it. And it, the other thing too is that it's not a hub. Kansas City's not a hub for anybody. So may, maybe after this change, it will be. Do you think that? No, maybe? heck no. Nobody wants to fly out of Kansas City. It's not the point. I, I'm okay with it because they have a hub in Dallas and they have a hub in Chicago. Ugh, and Chicago. so all of the well, it's Midway, which is a tiny airport. It's not. It's not O'Hare. O'Hare's okay. a nightmare. Oh, yeah. here's a walk. So is Charlotte. You go into Charlotte. It's like, oh, okay. I'm I'm 45 minutes to the gate from this plane to that plane. 45 minutes. And not, it's a walk. <laughs> Halfway, you're huffing. Yeah. You're like wheezing. You're like, <gasps> you ask for the cart. <laughs> yeah. Then they're like, you're not that old that you're asking for a cart. Then you get offended. You're like, How do, you don't, don't age me. But you know, if you're, uh, if you're looking at you're watching like, I don't have time. I got to get yeah, there. Well, go. and my heart rate is also. Which, we what ran, is that? The time we, or my heart uh, rate? <laughs> when we flew to um, to uh, what did it was tools. We went to tools in yeah. Pennsylvania, yeah. and that was uh, flying into what's the name of the town? Uh, Allentown. Allentown. Yeah, Allentown. So we fly into Allentown. I love that airport. That airport is awesome because yeah. it's it's literally just a, a runway. 
and then that's it. <laughs> yeah, so, it's a big room with a <laughs> runway on the end yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, I've flown into a few of those. <laughs> and that's fine. But to get there, you have to fly into Charlotte. And we land, and it's like, hey, Terminal 6D, Gate 58. And yeah. you're like, what in the? <laughs> okay. We ran. It's, my Me and my whole family have two little kids yeah. running, and we're like, we got to go. We got to. We barely got on that plane. I So I was in Charlotte um, before uh, Apex two years ago, and there were all these flight cancellations like the day before. So I get into Charlotte. And, dude, the entire concourse, like, before you go through security, is packed. Uh, I mean, you can't walk. You can't yeah. breathe. People yeah. are throwing things. And I I just had this really it's lucky event. As I'm, as I'm, like, going through, right, I'm trying to even just find a line to get through TSA, right? And and I'm asking, and there's the sheriff's officer there. I'm like, man, do you know where the line's at? He said, buddy, he said, I'll be honest with you. You can find a line. Be my guest. Get in it. But he said, I, I don't think anybody knows what's going on. He said, we're just here trying to keep the peace. Mm. And so at that point, there was a there was a young girl, um, and she was one of the porters pushing a wheelchair. And she's pushing it through, and she comes by, and this man grabs the wheelchair out of her hands, and he grabs it, and he throws it. And he, like, takes it out of her hands and tosses it. And, I mean, like, into a sea of people, right? There's nowhere to go. And so she just, like, breaks down. And and so I walk over to her, and I just felt terrible for this poor girl because I said, hey, you know, there's a spot over there between the – like, there's a spot where the, the area before security closes down a little bit. And we were standing in that closed-down spot. And right outside that, there was this little cutaway where she could go walk. And I said, hey, I said, you're doing a really good job. And it's okay. Like, walk out there and just catch your breath. Go over there. You can yeah. step aside, pull your mask down, catch your breath. You're okay. Because I could see her, like, going in full-blown panic mode, you know? And I felt bad. And I think everybody in the room was panicked at that point because it's just mm. a, a, on the verge of being a riot. Yeah. So she walked over there. She got her wheelchair. She pushed it over there. And a few minutes later, she came back. And she said, where did you need to go? And I said, I'm trying to get to anything pre check I've got to get to a uh, B... I think it's B sixty some or B sixteen, which is at the very end of the B concourse. And I, I said, I just need you to point me in the direction of security so I can get in the TSA line so I can go. And I've only got like fifteen minutes to get there. I think I've missed yeah. my flight. And she said, Come with me. And she like drags me all the way up to the front of the TSA pre check line, pulls the little thing up and says something, shows her badge and says something to the guy at TSA. And so I start to like go through the line and I'm putting my stuff up. He said, no, he said, she said, you're going through security. You need to go and like points at me. And I like run through security, dude. I run up into the gate and, and he's like, we're closing the door, we're closing the door. And I'm like running down the jet bridge <laughs> to get on the airplane. You know, like, holy cow, Eric, that's did not close. make that flight. <laughs> that's too close for comfort. Oh yeah, dude. And you know, I, that is the only tight experience I've ever had with American. I don't think I've ever had, and that wasn't their fault. They, yeah. they couldn't have done anything about it. They said that, that there was something like uh, 52,000 people pre-security in that airport that morning. Oh my God. Yeah. There was no, <laughs> you couldn't even breathe. <laughs> so. Well, Chicago, I got stuck overnight in Chicago on two consecutive trips. To- Holy cow. In O'Hare? Two consecutive trips. Yeah. O'Hare or Midway? Uh, Midway. Yeah. And I was like, and I've heard many people say, whatever you do, try to not schedule a layover. Yeah. yeah. In Chicago? In Chicago. Yeah. Oh, I do, we do it all the time. Because I fly out of Kansas City. It's like, if you're trying to get anywhere, mm. you're going to Chicago. Yep. <laughs> two, <laughs> two, two trips You're making him nervous. He's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> two trips in a row. I was like, all right. I, yeah. I am trying to avoid this airport at all. any I, cost. I, I will do my very best to fly direct everywhere I can because I mean the winters the winter can be a little dicey, but you know that's no different than New Hampshire. Like sometimes a lot of snow, like it is what it is. Yeah, being in a plane having to have it de-iced is quite common. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So you you were sharing a little bit about your shop ownership journey and that that you've been doing it a while, thirty one years. Yeah, and so you've been in. This, how long did you say you'd been in this group? Well, it, it changed from uh, RLO, you know, to yeah. uh, the Institute being uh, purchasing them out, but between the two, uh, 18 years. And I found out the uh, I was the infamous, been in it the longest of Holy. any current member. 
I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> Slow learner. <laughs> Slow learner, maybe. So, um, you know, I, I was pretty inspired by what you were telling me earlier. Um, because one of the things that we've talked to a lot of shop owners about, and we've had a lot of these discussions, is a lot of guys write it out to the very end, and they say, the shop is my retirement, and this is it, and I'm going to sell it, and I'm going to yeah. make a bunch of money. I'm going to do something. That's going to be my exit strategy, yeah. right? Yeah. And it sounds like you've come up with a different plan. Tell me what the plan is. Well, the plan, so I just turned 60. My plan for many years was to have a strategy in place by a, that time I was 62. Now, whether that was finding someone who was going to buy me out completely or be a partner so I only had to work, you know, four days a week, yeah. three days, whatever it may be, but just to give myself more flexibility to be able to do more things I wanted to do. Right. Uh, so luckily the current uh, guy, employee I'm working with was – Going to buy a place, had it all worked out, had the financing, SBA, local bank, plus savings, and uh, the deal fell through, and he was in my office interviewing. At that time, he expected to you know, be in his new business, yeah. running it, and but within a half hour of us sitting there talking and me finding out that I had like this amazing candidate to possibly be my successor, you know, yeah. sitting right in front of me, uh, to him saying, I can already tell that this is, this is going to be a better fit than what the other one right. was. And I'm, and I'm already glad that fell through. Cause I just, I got a better feeling about this already. And, so. and isn't that, isn't that amazing how like life just finds the perfect path you know yep. what I mean? Like things just, you know, what was it the guy said? Life has not found a perfect path. What are you talking about? <laughs> to literally dodging dumpster fires every single day. What in the hell are you saying? You dodge dumpster fires. You're 60 years old. You're not that old. Look, you're making me feel bad here because I'm like not that far away from you. I'm not saying I'm six years old. I may look like I'm six years old, but... I'm not that far away from you. You definitely don't act don't. like you're 60 years old. <laughs> you know, I freak everybody out because I tell them, I'm like, you know, middle age isn't in your 40s. Middle age is in your 30s, right? So all my texts are middle aged. I'm like, you're going to croak at 74 on average. So <laughs> 37, dude, you're yeah. middle aged. I know. Yeah. Well. And you're over the hill. <laughs> But, you know, things are going to change or whatever. Like, you may have another 25, 30 years, 35 years. Like, that's a whole lifetime for this one over here. So, yeah. like, wh why try to get out of the business, I guess, is what I'm asking. Oh, 31 years, and I should have added up the number of uh, employees when I was looking. When I was telling you about looking at QuickBooks yeah, to get information yeah. on a past guy. I should have added up the number of employees over 31 years i've had i mean it does kind of wear on you you know uh, i've had, yeah. had my ups and downs a lot of ups and downs uh definitely on the upside now and feel the best i've felt in a long time as far as about the you know the people i have in place and sure not having to go and work every day and like coming to this and feeling like i don't everything i don't even need okay. to yeah they'll, they'll text me or call me if there's a problem and if i don't hear from them I know I'm going to come back and there's not going to be any, any problems, you know? Yeah. So that's a great feeling. Um, but you know, of, uh, 31 years, uh, I worked 10 years before that at a Chevy Cadillac dealer as a flat rate tech. So that was, you know, so that's 41 years. You know, it's like, I feel like I've had, I, I mean, you know, there's certain as actually one of the biggest things that I'm like, Oh my God, Am I going to have to start paying for my own car repairs? That's actually one of the things that <laughs> has gone through my head. You know, like, I, I've said that before. I'm like, yeah. everybody makes fun of me that I'm going to try to sell the shop as quickly as possible. But I'm like, I'm not paying retail <laughs> yeah, <you> know, <laughs> for so car repair. I've had, I had enough cars and enough repairs done that I'm like, oh, my God, if I had to pay for all those oh, things. Oh, I know, oh, right? And now, oh, right? And now I might have to pay for them. I'm like, maybe I have to work something into the deal. Yeah, that's you it. Know? That's like, it. <laughs> when it's slow, we can pick and choose when you work on my cars. But, you know, we, uh, we, we get a deal. You know, we work a deal out or something. Uh, but what's next, though? 
Uh, well, I have a, a place up in Maine, so like I was telling you, when I leave here Friday, it's that's what they do when they're up in New England, like northern part of New England. They just go further north. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, you go north. <laughs> I, hang on, I'm, I am the complete opposite of that. I'm already trying to figure out how to go farther south. Well, huh? it's funny we uh, it, it, we have a lot of what we call snowbirds. You know, the people that summer, you know, lot in Florida uh, or winter, I should say, winter in Florida. They come in back to our area in the summer, um, and there's a lot that move down here. And it's funny how many you know. It's like a year, two years, a couple of yeah. years later. They're back. Hey, no, they, see, we listen, we've got a term for that. Okay. So I'm from the mountains of North Carolina. And the thing about the mountains of North Carolina is, is that in the mountains of North Carolina, it's two hours on the airplane to here. Okay. Not even quite two hours. And so right now it's in the forties, thirties, forties there. Okay. The, the coldest it gets is probably zero. Okay. Yeah. The hottest it gets is probably 95. So what we have found is everybody from up there, comes to Florida and then they become halfbacks because they come halfway back yeah. and they land in North Carolina and then they transit to Florida when it's cold and come back to North Carolina when it's warm because they can't handle the heat. So, Oh yeah. The heat is, it's intense. People that don't grow here. up in it aren't used to it. Right. They don't handle it very well. Oh, I know. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey of starting a shop. All right, so uh, just had the – there's nobody in my family that's mechanical. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so many times I hear, you know, at meetings like this and stuff, you hear about all these, you know, the generational things. Nobody in my family was even mechanically inclined, okay. like at all. Somehow, I, I don't know where I got it, but I just right from the beginning wanted to someday run my own shop. Yeah. So uh, out of high school, went to – Technical, you know, two-year technical okay. uh, associate degree program. Graduated first in my class. Uh, granted, that was like a class of like 30-some-odd that started, and only like a six or seven of us graduated, you know, right. high attrition rate. Uh, bounced around a couple dealerships, and finally, like I guess I uh, ended up at uh, Bank Chevrolet Cadillac and Concord, big, big dealer. Uh, basically, that's where I really got my – roots of on the job training and also a lot of, and they provide a lot of training. Okay. So I worked there 10 years, but was always, the goal was always by 30 to have my own place. So I had purchased a piece of land, had a ranch house on it, but it was, uh, you know, in a commercial right on the main road and everything. So I built the shop and then I, I still worked at the dealer, which is 30 miles away for a year. So I worked full time at the dealer for a year while I was, Started right, starting your own shop, yeah. Part time in my own shop, and that was a rough year. I bet so. Uh, I really wouldn't really recommend it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Let's just say, if I was married at the time, I probably wouldn't have been married. Still, right. A couple of years later, um, I mean, there was many, many. Uh, it was a small town where I, where I grew up and where I had my shop. It was only about seven, eight hundred when I uh, when I grew up, and it's only like twice that now uh but there was many nights that uh, the local cop would stop in you yeah. know just poke his head in the door i see the light's still on just want to make sure you're all right you know it's 10 o'clock 11 o'clock 12 o'clock right one o'clock not too often that was that late but once or twice you know and then have to get up the next morning drive do it all 30, over again 35 minutes well so that was a rough year but you know i quit like the week of my 30th birthday went to work, you know, full time. And, um, when my first employee was a guy who I worked with and had come and was working part time also, just like I was yeah. Yeah, helping me at my shop. And then, uh, you know, 30 years later, it's uh, been a roller coaster of many employees and many ups and downs. And how, how much did you pay for the piece of property in the first shop? Uh, the property when I bought it, I paid, I think it was like a uh, hundred thousand. Okay. And did you save all that up, or did you finance it, or did you? Uh, I had saved a good portion of it. Actually, uh, I was a saver. Right. You know, I would – the uh, I forget who it was at the dealership would come to me from time to time and say, you know, 
you get like six paychecks you have in cash. Will you, will you please deposit those things? Right. Like I, I'd have them <laughs> yeah. in a drawer in my toolbox, you know. Uh, right. Which wasn't the wisest thing to do, but it's just, uh, you know, I did spend it, you know. So, yeah, I was a, a saver, so I had saved up a lot, you know, so I didn't have to borrow too much. And then you financed the rest. And, and did you build your own building? Yeah, yep. so built the building. Then it was uh, about 15 years later, I put an addition onto it. Um, you know, still remember the first year, uh, cracked a million, which I never, ever, you know, right. I envisioned myself and a helper or two, maybe, you know, you know, it's, and now we're half again past that, you know, type of thing. Yeah. So just gone into territory. I never, ever envisioned right. even remotely possible, you know, so, and making more money than I ever envisioned. Right. Well, so why not go in the direction of the like nine shop owner? Like, why not go in that direction? That's just that's just not my thing. I, really? One time I thought it was, and I uh, so actually I have a, a stepdaughter who lives in Australia. So I've I've been to Australia several times. I had a daughter a little a little older than your average uh, person. So when my daughter was. Uh, I think she was only like maybe seven and she had, she'd flown to Australia like four times already by the time she was seven. And so one time when my wife and daughter were in Australia, I was, went and was talking with a guy I knew who was looking to get out and, yeah, you know, was talking about buying a shop and everything. And, you know, it's kind of one of those, I was riding a little bit of a roller coaster of, you know, right. yes, I want to have a second shop. And then, then you go through all these, uh, problems at your shop with employees or problem yeah. cars or whatever and all of a sudden it's like oh my god i'm dealing with these problems and if i mean obviously i know <laughs> that, twice as many <laughs> yeah i know that having listened to the the guys here and who are obviously very successful you know it's all about they delegating. all say you have to get past three yep yeah three, three shops so that's just, what they I, say i was just talking with a guy today and he said oh i get two shops and i said you know that's not good i said Two is not good. You yeah, need to either yeah. have one or three or more. Or more, right? yeah. It just puts you in a position where you can have another person yeah. to overlook everything. So, And I was never great at delegating. That was one of my problems. Um, so, I, I, I sense know. when when you say it was a roller coaster, and I sense when you talk about the employees that there's there's a little bit of pain or a little bit of like you feel it deep down inside when you say that. <laughs> Is that oh, yeah. is that That's accurate? one thing you don't learn. Everybody learns to work on cars. It was something I probably should have mentioned on the panel, but it, it's like the the advice. Well, oh, I cannot remember what it is that we were talking about, but the part of the 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 uh, perception in the industry is due to most shop owners don't have any soft skills. Yeah. And like you worked on cars, that's what yep. you did. Yeah, you didn't manage people, and all of a sudden you're a manager of people, not a fixer of cars. Yep. And like the gentleman was asking, how do you even get to the point where you're not putting out fires all day long? It's like stop answering their questions. And well, it's just some of those little. Those and I, you know, here's the thing: is is we've got to remember that you have a different experience than even a lot of us. Right. Because you were trained in a corporate setting. You were trained to hire and fire and delegate and lead people. Right. They don't train you. You Well, okay. You're a. So you weren't a tech. You just started as a tech. I went to tech school, flunked, and then flunked out. (laughs) I didn't flunk out. I just didn't finish. Um, (laughs) I just gave up. I just gave up. Well, I didn't have the money. I was, I was paying out of pocket and. Wait, it you know, was like it was like eleven hundred bucks for the semester, and I, I I signed up for some scholarships, and it was down to me and a single mom. Guess who got it? I, it wasn't me. We we don't <laughs> we don't you know we don't talk about your whole story nearly as much as everybody else's whole story on this show. It's because you react so much, <laughs> and you you drive in the little beaters. And like back and forth to school in the uh, what's that? No, I had a nice car then. Oh, I had Home some beers. brand new Honda Civic SI. Oh, that's what it was. That's what it was. <sighs> I can't. Imagine. I ended up selling parts, but okay. they, in the parts world, what they do is they get young, 
younger people um, to to take a really low salary and work them seventy to eight hours, eighty hours a week. That's it. Yeah. And they're like, "Hey, we're going to promote you to store manager." You're like, "Oh, well, here's your salary." At the time, they gave you a very nice stock option bonus i'd be a millionaire right now if i hadn't sold out (laughs) whatever (laughs) that's that's something that i would you know i wish somebody had walked up and said doesn't matter what you think you are going to do with that money whatever you think you're going to make with that money do not sell until the very last minute and then dump it all i i know a girl who um her dad was one of the original lowe's hardware employees Mm -hmm. And and he worked up through the ranks, and it, it had nothing to do with, with money or anything else. He loved the company. He was loyal to the company. He worked for him for years and never touched anything to do with that stock option, just kept it and just sat on it. And, you know, he started almost, I guess it would have been 50 years ago. You know? Well, they, they, they had you, you were fully vested in four years, and you had to do something with it by year 10. So if I had, or you get fired, but you had to do something. So when you had a 10 year option to do something with it, but you know, by, by your fifth year, you get itchy and you're like, man, it's sort I'm, I'm going to cash out $60,000. Yeah. Let's go. Let's do this. <sighs> anyway, yeah. anyway, they, they, uh, so they, they hire these kids in and when I say kids, I'm like, they're early twenties, right? Yeah. yeah. And they work them like borrowed meals. That's all it is. Like, and, and, hey, your payroll percentage needs to be 11%. And you're like, okay. And it's not even, 11's high, by the way. I'm talking like 9% mm-hmm. payroll percentage. And a, a payroll percentage of 9% and a store doing 100000 to 150000 to, when I left, was doing almost $300,000 a month in sales. A 9% payroll percentage in a $300,000 store lets you have some employees. But when you're doing $85,000 a month, Nine percent per payroll percentage is nothing. Yeah, that's you, and maybe two other employees. And so yeah. somebody has to staff the store from seven thirty to nine thirty at night, seven days a week. Yeah. Who's going to be there to do that? The salaried employee. <laughs> yeah, that's the store manager. Yeah. So and the ones that survive and make it past those first couple of years are the ones that figured out. I got to learn some soft skills. I got to be able to manage a whole bunch of part-time employees, mm-hmm. some older, some younger. I've got to be able to figure out how to get all my tasks done on a daily basis. I've got to not be the person that answers all the questions, answers all the phones, check out all the customers, looks up all the parts. I can't yeah. do that. No. Thousands of phone calls are coming in constantly. So you still, you learn very quickly to delegate, delegate and inspect. And that, that experience has served you well. It really has. I mean, because I, I, I threw it all out the window when I opened my shop. Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about it, right? And I'm thinking, man, I wish somebody had told me some of that, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I could have really done something with that, you know? And I I, I think as owners, it's, it's all too often that, you know, I fill each one of those employees, right? I'm the same way. I look at my shop management software. I look in QuickBooks, and I see all those inactive employees, and I'm like, <sighs> You know, like it, it's not exactly a good feeling, and, but, but that's what business does, right? Yeah. I mean, you, there's times when, unfortunately, you, you hire a body, you know? Yeah. Most of the time, you try not to do that, but there's, there were times when I did that many times, and it was just, it was worse than having nobody, yeah. Yeah. as it turned out. Yeah. You know, but- uh, Almost those, every those time. The, almost every single time, that yeah. ends up being the case. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, part of the learning experience, you know? As they say, yeah. Unfortunately, I see. But a lot of that stuff, like you abandon it, you abandon it because there were in in operating a store. It doesn't matter how big it is. The one thing, like for me, the one thing I didn't have to deal with, because you know, you look back at that and go, I was wildly successful at what I was doing. I was able to show double digit growth year over year during the Great Recession. Mm-hmm. There were, and even then, like when I was, even before that, I had competitors coming into town and I wasn't showing a decrease in sales. I, you know, I had upper management coming in going, every other store has a competitor come in, sees double digit decrease in sales. You're flat for the year. Well, yeah, I am because I do X, Y, and Z. 
And I look back and I'm like, why was I able to execute so easily there? And the difference is when you open your own business, all of a sudden, things that they were able to handle at corporate were now on you. Yeah. Specifically the marketing. Mm. I always had customers. You open the doors, you turn the sign on, phones start ringing. Customers are coming in the door. Your job was to retain those customers, convert those phone customers into in the walking customers and take care of those walking customers to make sure they come back a second time and that they always come to you, yeah. to the, to your store, that you have a good crew, that you're reliable, that you hire good people. There's things you put in place, sure. but you never had to worry about where are the customers going. Where's that next car going to come in? And that, that, that was uh, earth shattering for me and paying the taxes and handling the, I don't, I still don't pay the taxes. I don't pay those taxes. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to deal with that. He's in New Hampshire. Sales tax? No sales no. tax in New Hampshire. They have income tax, though, right? Live, live free or die. <laughs> you, you guys have income tax, though, there. Yeah. Yeah. That's not very much, though. No, taxes aren't bad. But it's funny how uh, people come in from out of state and they- Live free or die. Yeah. I love that. Some, That's I, It's on their license plates. Yeah. Actually, my uh, my wife has a friend- from down this way i'll say and, uh, <laughs> you know it's like we had no helmet law you know motorcycle helmet law yeah. or anything and so she always said live free and die <laughs> that, was, that was always her thing but she was also one that didn't understand a lot of the basics of like she'd see places where i mean logging and you know new hampshire yeah. and northeast and stuff and so she'd see where they would they'd be logging and she'd be like they're gonna they're going to replant a tree for each one they cut, right? <laughs> and we're like, no. Come back in a year and see how many are already grown up. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. no. It, it's clueless, you know. Yeah. Clueless. Yeah. Uh, they do grow back, you know. Oh, yeah. The tree oh, is fast. Yeah. Like, and, and, a lot faster. And here's the thing. Like, they need to grow back. It's, I, don't, I don't understand that people ha have an issue with logging. It's like, you know, if I cut all the trees down, I'm out of business, right? <laughs> Like, I have to have more trees. So we're going to make sure that we sustain this and that we have more trees growing. 